First of all, I've just been inspired to be with so many of you today. Uh, this is an event uh, really looking in the eye of a, a new national situation and recognizing that common ground solutions uh, may be the most promising path forward uh, to advanced opportunity and equality. Uh, and today, you know, we've talked about the importance of place uh, and local leaders in advancing this agenda, of uh, the role of finance, the value proposition of an outcomes mindset in government and the social sector. We've uh, talked about evolutions uh, in the market economy uh, and uh, the incredibly promising new directions that academia and thought leaders are having uh, to use data to understand broad trends and uh, have that data inform policy and program and service delivery on the ground. We also have heard some lightning talks on education. We'll be having more uh, highlight examples of how data and evidence is driving better results for communities uh, around the country. Uh, and we're going to continue to work together, um, not just at the happy hour earlier today and the conversations we had um, uh, earlier uh, earlier today, but also tomorrow, to surface additional solutions that are actionable uh, that we can look uh, to make progress on uh, in the near future. Uh, and now I, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, a terrific panel uh, of leaders who are focused on how do we get better outcomes uh, from a variety of, of different uh, perspectives. Uh, so Paul Bress uh, will will lead a panel uh, with Laura Arnold, the co-chair of the Laura and John Arnold Foundation, which has been one of the most essential philanthropic forces uh, to emerge just in the last several years, um, advancing this agenda uh, at every level. Uh, we also, uh, recognizing the incredible importance of local uh, government and county government. We're thrilled to have uh, the elected president of the National Association of Counties, Brian Deloge, who's been um, a tremendous partner, bipartisan leader, uh, Republican elected official and partner with the White House on the Data Driven Justice uh, Initiative, who provide the local perspective. Uh, and Amy O'Hara, who is leading some of the most advanced work uh, <laughs> on linking data across systems and in the federal infrastructure. Uh, so this is a terrific group, and we're so glad uh, to have Paul Brest lead us in this conversation. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And here, here's what we're going to do. We're going to spend not more than five minutes per person with me spending even less describing what we think are, giving one example of some real benefit of evidence-based policymaking or evidence-based programs by nonprofit or other agencies, and then an example of something that's a barrier or a problem. And then we may talk or argue among ourselves for a bit and then open it up to you. And just to get things going, let me say, I've been, I've been doing some work for quite some time on so-called pay-for-success programs, programs where an organization, usually a nonprofit, but sometimes not, uh, gets paid not for providing services, but for the actual outcomes. And the advantage of pay-for-success programs is that whether, they are, whether the ultimate payment comes from a government, as it usually does, or from private philanthropy, resources are scarce. And by paying for outcomes rather than paying for services, the hope is that uh, one will maximize the use of those resources. And it's very fitting that, that we talk about this in the context of a conference on poverty, even though it has a somewhat different name, uh, because many, many of the pay for success programs involve uh, poor uh, people, uh, involving families, children, recidivists, uh, I guess most rich people don't need pay for success programs. Um, so the benefits are the use of resources. And the other hopeful benefit is that it moves both the service providers, the nonprofit <laughs> sector more broadly, and government officials to be outcome focused rather than service oriented. Those are the advantages. Barriers. Uh, 
in order to know what works, and to a large extent in order to decide whether a service provider gets paid, uh, requires a payment scheme that's usually underlain by evaluation. Good evaluations are expensive. Uh, on the other hand, they do uh, carry the field forward, so one develops knowledge. That's one barrier. Another barrier is the flip side of the hope, which is the mindset of many government uh, officials and many nonprofit leaders is not outcome oriented. And changing the mindset itself is both the hope but also a significant barrier of pay for success schemes. So with that introduction and with an invitation to my co-panelists to spend a little bit longer on than I have, uh, let, let's begin with Laura. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Paul, and uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, at the Lauren Donald Foundation, we have been thinking about the issue of data, about the issue of changing systems to address issues of social justice uh, for, for some time, and we certainly don't have uh, all the answers, but we do have some very strong theories as to what we think is, the, uh, is a, a favorable path forward. Uh, our work spans from you know, everything from infrastructure, uh, data infrastructure, to technical assistance in, um, in jurisdictions and sort of creating the landscape of utilizing data, creating the appetite for, uh, for studying social programs and evaluations and sort of everything in between. One specific example that is, I think, worth highlighting in that regard is our work with policy labs. We have spent a great deal of, uh, of energy and effort and resources in creating partnerships between academics and local governments. Uh, one particularly comes to mind, our work in Rhode Island with a policy lab called Ripple uh, that, that pairs a, a, a very favorable and, uh, and very sympathetic, if you will, government team that, that really wants answers to these questions as to how do we best deploy state resources, federal government resources to maximize opportunity you know, minimize injustice, you know, with respect to our most uh, disadvantaged communities. Pairing those a, a, a government actors that have an appetite for finding those answers with extraordinarily competent researchers who can contribute to those um, to those analyses. So we've done that. Now the uh, the Rhode Island Policy Lab is uh, probably in its third year, and uh, we have around 17 projects in the works, ranging from everything from, uh, from homelessness to social issues to, uh, to SNAP benefits, poverty. So very relevant issues where governments want answers as to how best to administer existing programs and whether or not certain programs succeed at all so that they can channel resources to more successful programs. Uh, so that was, would be something that I would highlight as, a, as an interesting, potentially quite successful concept that we hope to replicate. In terms of uh, a barrier, I would say that um, in most of you who are academics and certainly those of you who are in policy would agree that the uh, implementation and creating the culture shift toward evidence-based policymaking is, has historically been somewhat of a heavy lift. We have some solutions and some uh, proposed paths forward to address that, but uh, we have found that creating the technical capacity within governments and also the appetite for this kind of, this kind of work has, um, has been somewhat of a challenge. But we have many policy labs in the works and are very optimistic. Can you, before we turn to, to Brian, can you give an example of one outcome from the policy labs or elsewhere that you're really excited about and one disappointment, whether or not you name the, the place yeah. or not? <laughs> uh, I don't think that we have seen yet studies that, would, uh, that have been completed such that we would understand whether or not there's been a disappointment. In other words, I don't know that we've... Um, I don't know that they've been in action long enough to have a good body of data. Uh, I can point to a number of studies that are ongoing that we think will yield interesting answers that will absolutely have an impact on poverty fighting. One that comes to mind, again in Rhode Island, would be, the, uh, would be a study on how to administer SNAP benefits. 
there's a, a, the, the hope is to understand whether or not administering them in two payments per month instead of one will create better outcomes for those families so that they don't spend all of their money in the first part of the month and you know, suffer hardships in the, in the latter part of the month, uh, thereby creating kind of more, more problems for the government and also problems for themselves. So that's one where we were, we're following it with great interest and we have, um, you know, and, and we have some, we have reason to believe that that will yield some very interesting results. Thank you. Brian. Sure. Um, well, thanks. I appreciate the White House and I appreciate uh, Stanford. And this is a great discussion. And frankly, it's long overdue. And we are at local government, I can tell you, we are thirsting and dying for all the help we can get out there. Um, so I'm the current president of the National Association of Counties. I am an elected official in Florida. Um, we've got 3,069 counties across the country today. In California, they're called supervisors. In Florida, they're called commissioners. In Louisiana, they're called police jurors. In Texas, they're called judges. Everybody has a little different name. We generally do the same thing, which is we are where the rubber meets the road. We're local government. We're the people delivering the power and the sewer and picking up your garbage and making sure the roads work. All the fundamental things that you, you need, um, we've got what I would consider an unlimited amount of need with a very finite, defined amount of resources. And so the, the, the challenge for us is how do we get as smart as we can to use what limited resources we have to have the, the, the best results. Um, we are also very risk averse because frankly, very few taxpayers that I know want me to go out and spend their money on something that's not proven. So the data-driven type of model is very important to us to show that things that have worked. Um, the other thing I can tell you that is just a historic, it's just a political disadvantage, which is most elected officials, and I don't want to say this is the uh, everybody, but don't have a real long-term uh, opinion of how things should work. In other words, they're incented to try and please the voters and get reelected, which is frankly a complete disjoint if you think about how things work. In other words. Things like saving money and uh, exercising and eating vegetables we all recognize as good, but most of us realize they're kind of painful and not great to start with. But long term, these are things we all want to do. Well, elected officials are, it's Liberty Hall, ice cream at every meal kind of thing because we want to make you happy. Um, so let me talk about a, what I would consider a success, which frankly has radically changed one particular county. Um, and then I'll talk about what I think are some of the barriers from local government standpoint. So Dade County, a number of years ago, had 8,000 inmates in their jail system in Dade County. Um, we spend, for 1,000 inmates in my county, we spend roughly $30 million a year to house, feed, clothe, and medicate about 1,000 inmates. So you can do the math. Dade County, I think, was spending $270 million. They had uh, one of the local news channels or 60 Minutes or some expose, and they came in and realized how bad their system had gotten. They were having multiple patient, multiple inmates in the jail cell, mentally ill, completely unsanitary. Somebody pointed out there are zoos that take better care of their animals. So you look at it and say it was out of control. And it was a wake-up call for the commissioners in Dade County. So they said, what do we do? And so they started looking at the way the system works. There's a great commissioner, Sally Heyman, down there, and Judge Steve Leifman, who have collectively worked and now the inmate population down there is about 4,000. Well, you do the math on this, and most people will tell you that's a win by anybody's standard. T two things they did, and it didn't happen overnight, but these are things that, frankly, we should be able to share. And one of the challenges, I'll fast forward, is, you know, in the private sector, if you guys break the code and you figure out, I've got a competitive advantage on how to beat my, my uh, peer group out, that's what, in business, that's your competitive advantage. You're not going to tell anybody. Well, in government, we ought to do a better job of telling the story among ourselves about what's working. So Dade County did two things to frame the, the discussion. Um, about a third to a half of the people in our jails across the country, and to put it in perspective, the entire federal and state prison system has about 2 million people. We process about 11 million people a year in the county jails across the country. So when people start talking criminal justice, Local government has the biggest seat at the table and the most to gain or lose. Um, two things Dade County did. One was crisis intervention, which meant about one out of three, I think, of every law enforcement on the street in Dade County was trained in mental health uh, intervention. They understood when somebody had something that displayed mental health tendencies, they knew what the signs were, 
how to case manage that person, how to get them to a psych center or to a hospital or to a more appropriate place than a jail. Um, and so if, you, if you're a street cop and you ran into a situation, you would call the person and say, how do we deal with this person, crisis intervention? The other piece is civil citation, which frankly, I, I don't understand we're not doing more of this, which is taking the low level, nonviolent, and the, this is at the police discretion at the street, and issuing them the equivalent of a speeding ticket or a, a hard parking ticket. Uh, so if you have a college student who gets stopped and he's got a minor amount of dope in his pocket, he's not going to go to jail, be processed through the prison or through the jail system, get a felony arrest record, lose his scholarship, you see what happens. But we have situations today where somebody runs a toll and it's a dollar toll and they get a $25 fee. This happens all the time. Six months later, they cruise through a stop sign and the cop says, hey, you got an outstanding toll here and you just rolled through a stop sign. Guess what? I'm suspending your license. All right, they couldn't pay the dollar toll. Now they've got a, a drive through a stop sign and now they've got a suspended license. They still have to work. Six months later, they're driving to work. They're driving with a suspended license. Guess what? Go to jail, do not pass go, do not collect $200. That person now has no ability to feed his family, no ability to pay his child support, or he will lose his job. I mean, the social impact. So, and I'll end with this, because I feel pretty strongly about this. I think in our generation, the next civil rights movement will be that there are more poor, minority, unadjudicated people in the jails across the country today than there are in the entire state and federal prison system. These are people that cannot afford to make bail for whatever reason, and they have done something that's so minor and so trivial that they shouldn't be spending in jail. And it's the least, uh, 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 it's the most expensive, least positive way for us to deal with this. We have 5% of the world's population, you've heard this, 25% of the world's incarcerated people. It's spun out of control, the whole get tough on crime thing. So, and I'll finish with this, Paul. I pro uh, so, the, here's Dade County, great, great, great example of something that's working. How do we as elected officials share that and how do we prove to other counties around the country that this model works and that they should somehow replicate this? And that's where we need some help from a standpoint of disseminating the word, proving what's been done, um, and giving elected officials a little bit of backbone so that they can make a decision that maybe is not gonna have an impact in the next six months or the next year and they can start to make those investments that most businesses do to survive and thrive. So um, that's my examples. I hope that's helpful. Great. So, so I'm going to give you, give you a little bit of advance notice after, after Amy talks, and I'm going to come back to you and ask for an example of something, whether done by Dade or Leon County or any government, that looked like it was going to really work and didn't. OK. But first to Amy. I, I love failure. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I hope I can deliver that in my example. <laughs> so I work at the Census Bureau, and our goal is to measure the US population and economy, and that's a big job. And so we gather data, we collect data from people. And as an example, and I'm going to be using veterans as my example, you can go to the VA website, and you can look up veterans in poverty. And you'll see that nearly 7% of ve veterans are living in poverty, and that's 1.4 million people. They know that because we collected the American Community Survey. We collected it from 2.3 million US households. And we do that every year. We're gathering this data, we're disseminating it, and other agencies and researchers and businesses are using that data. But is that enough? Is there other data that we could use? And you've heard earlier that there are lots of other data sources. So could we get the access to the data and develop the infrastructure to join up those different data sources? So for veterans, we took the data that we'd collected in the American Community Survey, and we wanted to see how many of those veterans are participating in the food stamps program. So we negotiated with New York and got access to person-level data on the SNAP program. Now, we had already collected that sort of information in the American Community Survey, and you could see the trends there. But this was much more granular data, and it enabled us to take a deeper look at what was happening in veterans' lives, and we could see a difference between the period of service, so that the veterans who had served after 2001 had a higher eligibility rate relative to veterans who had served in other periods. But it's also important to look at take-up. So we saw who was eligible for food stamps, but then who was actually taking it up during the Great Recession. 
and there was no statistically significant result. And that's really why you need to build evidence. You need to have access to the data, you need to be in the data, and you need to be looking at it. So that's great, that's how we had data, it turned into evidence. But I just described for you a project that used a sample survey and data from one state. And we had data from one state because there is no national repository of food security data. It's actually housed within each state. And if you want to access it and link it, you have to negotiate currently with each state. And that's what we were talking about earlier. There are interoperability issues. There are contract issues. It's very time intensive. It's not that technologically difficult. There's just a lot of governance and a lot of upfront cost in order to do it. But it's possible. So we did that. But then we said, well, what if we wanted to move beyond that? And so we negotiated with VA to get data on all veterans. And now we're talking. We're not dealing with a survey sample. We're looking at the universe in that group. And although I'm talking about veterans, we could be talking about other vulnerable groups. I could be talking about very young children. I could be talking about disconnected youth. I could be talking about ex-offenders, because the same the same paradigm fits. If you can get access to the data, and you can link it, and you can get researchers into the data in a secure space that has respect for the individuals whose data you're using, so this does have consent and privacy implications. It has data security and information security implications. But if you can manage those, there's this great opportunity to build evidence. And so those are my success stories, but then what is our challenge? Well, what we want to do moving forward is take the information on all veterans and look at some of their outcomes to try to avert poverty in the first place. Who is participating in the educational programs that VA offers? For instance, the post-9-11 GI Bill. The United States has spent $67 billion on this program. We don't really know the outcomes. So what do we mean by outcome? We want to know whether these people are employed, whether they are earning more or less than their peer group, what programs matter. How do we do that? Well, we're going to need cooperation across a number of different departments, because right now we want to get data from Department of Ed. They don't know which people are veterans. We already have some data from VA, but they don't know the outcomes for these individuals that are participating in these programs. We also want to fold in data from Department of Defense, because they know what happened to these individuals before they became veterans. They know where they served. They know the training programs they had while they were in the military. They have this rich information on aptitude tests. How do you fold that into the mix in order to build evidence? And then ultimately, how do you match it to that employment and earning data, which is often trapped in the IRS or the Social Security Administration? So my job at Census is to be that integrator to try to take our existing authority and our existing infrastructure and link across these different data silos in order to build evidence. And there are enormous barriers, because you need everybody to say yes. But you need to make sure that you incentivize this so that everybody understands that the answer that you're seeking, the answer that you're going to get, is worth it. Brian, counties have an enormous amount of data that are relevant to social programs. How good are counties at sharing the data? Not very good. And, and if you think about the way the structure works, um, at the federal government, everything, you've got one layer of kind of bureaucracy. And at the state, state by state, you clearly have that. Counties are, you know, we're subsidiaries of the state effectively, but there's 3,069 counties, and every one is doing things a little differently. But there's no playbook. And so people learn as they go. Um, so to answer your question, uh, you know, the National Association of Counties, which I'm president of now, that's one of the roles we fill, but our hands are somewhat limited in the ability to get that information out. I, every president gets an initiative, so my initiative is what are the 100 best practices in the country today that's going on in county government? And there are some very cool things going on, and we need to do a better job of sharing that. Paul, can I ask a question? Absolutely. Uh, Brian, uh, to what extent do you think that um, regulatory barriers are a reason why the data isn't shared. So I, I guess two things. So there's one, there's a distinction between sharing the data and uh, best practices. Mm -hmm. So certainly best practices or you know, someone's description of something that he or she believes has worked in a jurisdiction is kind of a subjective thing unless you it's Unless a, it's been rigorously evaluated through, but it's, you know, a, it's, a, it's, a, but, it's a great question. Yeah. But to what extent do you think the pushback is that state law or sort of some local regulation is preventing us from?
or making the data readily available? So I use, we're working with the White House on the data, data Driven Justice Initiative, and there are what we call super <laughs> utilizers. These are the people mm -hmm. that are in our jails regularly, that are in our hospitals regulator, regularly, that are in our, that are in our um, uh, uh, psych centers, and they j just literally, it's almost a revolving door for uh, the, a small percentage of these people are, are killing us financially. And I, I know we've tried to create a program in my county where I've got EMTs going into patients' homes to try and stop them from riding our ambulances every week because they want to get their, you know, their blood pressure spikes and they, go, they call 911, they go to the hospital, we have to carry them, the hospital has to process them. It's a, it's a huge load. Well, the, one of the issues is how, with HIPAA and with some of the other uh, data sets that are out there, how do we find that stuff out or the day, how do we get it in a meaningly, meaningful format so that we can actually go out and try and triage and case manage this small percentage that drives an overwhelming amount of the cost? Yeah, so it seems to me that part of the conversation from your members, or, you know, from, from the people that you, that, that congregate in the associations should be how to address that issue, mm -hmm. right? how to, uh, has anybody successfully addressed the super utilizer question from a data sharing perspective? And can you create a hub for sharing the, uh, the confidentiality agreements or whatever, you know, whatever structure has been proven to be successful, or at least has promise of being successful, just to get at the data? Then that's sort of, to me, a threshold question before you even get to what works is can you can you get the data? How do we? So I use our, in our county, we have the, uh, you know, we've identified a small number of people that are riding our ambulances every week. And then they're showing up in the hospital every week. And it's, I'll use it, it's a couple hundred people that maybe drive $5 million worth of use. It's a small number that just, they blow up the system. Um, but for us to try and figure out how to solve that, I'll fall back and say, we, we, we don't, I don't have the extra resources to get my EMTs to go out and do something that's out of the norm. If you're riding in my ambulance, there's a billing mechanism under Medicare and Medicaid, and even though we only collect some of it, and when you get to the hospital, there's a billing mechanism, so the system's a little bit fractured. Uh, by the way, if I, but if I send an EMT out to Ms. McGillicuddy's house to check her blood pressure or her you know, uh, uh, sugars or whatever, I, there's no way that gets reimbursed. And so in my world, 70 plus percent of my budget in our county, and it's pretty representative, is mandated by the state and federal government of things we've got to do, roads, courts, you know, uh, the things that we are servicing. So these extra things, it's a struggle to, to fund them and to break through some of the barriers. So uh, It'd be interesting to think of whether, uh, to go back to pay for success, you could imagine a, a provider uh, relieving, actually taking the risk and experimenting with these high flyers in your, your states. Um, I'm going to ask Laura a question, then I think Amy has a chance to maybe ask anybody a question, then we'll open it up to you to ask questions. So I, I had the great privilege just before this of uh, being in Laura Ariaga and Dreesen's class, this building is named after, in memory of her mother, in which um, this Laura, <laughs> Laura Arnold was the guest. And there is no foundation in existence, ever in existence, I think, that's more connected with evidence, trying to develop evidence through supporting randomized controlled trials. And yet, in the, in the class, you showed a, uh, probably not surprising to many of you, but a disquieting slide when you actually see what programs work. Uh, you know, out of 40 teen pregnancy programs, there are three that uh, have been shown to work in a rigorous evaluation. And in some ways, that's not surprising because uh, even when you have a very good RCT, the problem of external validity, which many of you live, uh, something that works one place just may not work in another environment. So why aren't you depressed <laughs> about what happens when you actually ask what works and see that things, that there are not as many social programs that one can have confidence in that you would hope? Uh, well, I'm not depressed. In fact, I'm, I'm exceedingly optimistic. One of the reasons that I'm optimistic is that I believe that if we can collectively create uh, an infrastructure where we expand the universe of programs that are tested, we start arriving at better answers. 
So I think that the universe, that universe that was, you know, however many, uh, several hundred programs that were tested uh, in, in various fields and did not lead to favorable results, ideally should be many, many. So much of our work is to try to identify which programs have promising evidence. If it's not an RCT, but something falling short of an RCT, but something that is directionally positive, that we can then test through an RCT uh, and hopefully contribute to collective learning in the field. I think that's, that has added value. So I, our experience has been that if we channel efforts and resources to identifying those kinds of programs, programs that have some sort of evidence base of success, and expand that universe, and subsequently you know, conduct rigorous evaluations of those, we will get those percentages higher. We will, we will have a, a broader universe of options to choose from. But I think that, to me, those preliminary studies that, that you're referencing, which is, you know, I had this abysmal, as, as Paul noted, depressing slide that showed that many of the, as you all know, many of the, uh, to the extent that the federal government has conducted randomized control trials itself with respect to government, to, to programs that it funds, the success rates have been uh, exceedingly low. I think that um, that is, I would say that that is phase one of the programs that we're talking about. If we expand the universe of programs to evaluate, and if we are more careful to, uh, about selecting those programs such that the programs that we actually fund and we then research have a higher probability of success, I think we, we, end, in a, we end up in a better place. And so I'm not pessimistic at all. I think, that it's, I think it is a good uh, start of a conversation as to how to make programs better. Right, and something the foundation does is support replication, which is one way to deal with the external validity problem. Amy, any, any questions for other panelists or anything you'd like to add before we throw it open? I would. It's a, a question for Brian. You described what I think of as tactical data use. So you have people that are on the ground and they're trying to figure out how to intervene in Mrs. McGillicuddy before she drives another $400 bill. But I am in the world of statistical data use. How could, there, how could we construct incentives for more data sharing to get the tactical data either out of the county or another example, there are more than 18,000 law enforcement units in the United States that have a lot of data trapped there. And how do we convince you to share the data with identifiers so that we would be able to actually identify the high flyers? Because many times whenever we engage with the people that have the data, they say, well, I might share it with you, but you're certainly going to get de-identified data. But de-identified data, while useful in some analyses, is not going to permit the sort of matching that you need to really understand what's happening, the, to see the dynamics. So great question. If there's a way, and you guys, there's a lot of smart people in the room, if there's a way to strip out the identifiers and build the case, for instance, in my world, in the county, when we started talking about, we want to have EMTs go out to Ms. McGillicuddy's house. Um, I, we figured the most appropriate funder would be the hospital. They're on the other side of this equation. Let's go into this together. And they said, yeah, not so much. We're up to our ears. And everybody is. I mean, you know, there's a limited amount of funds out there. But if there was a way to find that, if, you know, let's, let's just build the case without naming the person or the people. I don't, again, you'd have to get into how you, how you mask the data. So that I know that these 25 people drive, you know, 75% of the costs in this area, then I've got something to sell. Then I can walk around and say, okay, I've built a financial case and I can get some funding or some help and some partners in the process. Uh, but I'm stonewalled, like you pointed out, because of HIPAA, because of, you know, the, the, my sheriff and the most of the police, for, they're not going to share that kind of data. So this technology exists, but you would need to apply a data adapter on your end in order to send it. Would you be willing to put that on your IT system? Like putting them on the spot. Yeah, no, I, I, I would in a heartbeat. If I could, if, if if we could around the country build the case, you got two separate things here. Build the case, solve the problem, mm -hmm. and the case gets all the partners in the room together and says, okay, hospitals, jails, those people are all going to have to pony up and have to figure out how to make this work. Then you could go out and solve the problem. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it would be huge if we could figure out a way to to get from where we are now, which is just stonewalled in so many of these data silos. Uh, and law enforcement, as you pointed out, is a big one. Um, a lot of the mental health issues, 
a lot of the HIPAA issues. Um, it's tough mm -hmm. to try and assimilate all that. We all know it's happening, and a anecdotally, I can talk about it all day long, but the problem is getting it to a point. And that, you know, the, we've been working at it with the White House on the data-driven justice thing. That's a, you run into some walls with that, so. Good, good question, though. Paul, can I ask Amy a question? Please. Before, uh, before we open it up? And since I'm the non-practitioner in the room, I get to ask the stupid questions, and I don't get to, uh, to speak very often with the, with the leading practitioners in the field. So, um, Sunni, why do you think this is so hard? Why do you think, because intuitively, I would think that everybody uh, would agree that Analyzing data is a good thing. Uh, but in your, in your specific field, based on your specific projects and your experience, um, why do you think that there's so much resistance and you're, you're, you're having to overcome so many obstacles? I think that data access and people feeling that they can share their data for this sort of work is really the sticking point. And the Census Bureau has unique authority within government that we're able to access data with identifiers because we have one of the 12 exceptions to the Privacy Act. And we also have a statute that has very, very strong confidentiality protections. And that's because we can only use the data for statistical purposes. We can't use it for enforcement, we can't use it for surveillance, and we can't use it for marketing. And so that makes a lot of people willing to share their data with us. And we are compelled in our statute to use more of this data to reduce burden and produce better statistics. But I can ask people for data and they can say no. The other problem that I see is that even with that broad authority and even with decades of use of administrative data and a lot of great success stories, it's still difficult because we don't get an appropriation to do this sort of evaluation. We're a statistical agency. We're supposed to measure the population and economy. So if there was a way to get this sort of work funded and leverage our authority, that would be a way forward, but you would still need to get the people that have the data to be willing to share it. Relative to other countries, they have national statistics acts where the parts of government that have the data are compelled to share it with another integrator. And we lack that in the United States. We have a fragmented statistical system, and we don't have any laws on the books that compel most agencies to share their data. Right, we're a federal system, and <coughs> as, as Brian can probably talk for a long time about this, each state is essentially a federal system also, yeah. so it's, yeah. it's much tougher. In the few minutes until we get dragged off the stage, uh, why don't we open it up for any of you? We're, we're a little bit blinded by the lights. So if you want to talk five minutes, it says. Uh, sure. So why don't you go ahead? Yeah, just really quickly to Amy. Uh, how concerned are you about the American Community Survey? Uh, the current Congress has taken some shots at it and said they're going to completely defund mm -hmm. it. Uh, now that there is control over the executive, legislative, and judicial branch, most likely, are you concerned that we're going to lose this entire body of work that you do through the ACS? The Census Bureau has done studies of what would happen if the American Community Survey changed from mandatory to voluntary, and those research reports are available. Uh, it has a detrimental effect. And then it's difficult to imagine the impact of not having the American Community Survey at all. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that it is baked into so many products that the private sector has developed. The API has enormous use, and whenever you're looking at any of the major media visualizations, they're often driven by the American Community Survey. So the Bureau has weathered this threat over time, and it remains to be seen how, uh, how much of a threat it is in the coming months. Hi, Virginia Hamilton with the U.S. Department of Labor. I, I, I'd like to answer your question in some part, uh, Laura. I spent about four years trying to get, I worked for the state of California, people to share data around employment outcomes. And one of the reasons people don't like to share data is because they, they're very, very suspicious about how it's going to be used. So if I'm a community college, some people go to community colleges just to take a couple of classes to brush up their skills. I don't want to be lumped into these programs don't work because this person didn't get a job. Um, people who work in vocational rehabilitation, it takes them several years maybe and a lot of investment to get people into work. They didn't want to be measured against people who are running short-term job training programs. So it's not, 
I mean, it, it is FERPA and it's all the laws, but it's also really sort of deep suspicion <laughs> about how the data is going to be interpreted when compared to other data. Thank you. There's a question over there. Hi, thank you all so much. Uh, my name is Ari. I work with the United Nations on Innovation for Sustainable Development. And I was wondering if there are any best practices that could be shared on an international level, and how can we increase collaboration on data and evidence for the global community? A little out of my league. <laughs> so the international uh, units that work in administrative data some of them are a lot like the US, and we have a common lament. It's like, oh, we don't have a universal identifier. We don't have statistics laws that uh, enable us to have ready access to the data. But then there are so many other countries that have systems of integrated registers that they already have this kind of locked down. They have great information there. Uh, in terms of their uses for, for evidence building, there are a lot of applications in the UK that you can look at, a number of great applications. Uh, really around the world, but it's the, the people that are struggling like us, those are the ones that I think I've spent the most time with because the ones that already have the integrated registers, they've been using their data for both administrative and statistical and evaluative purposes for decades. How's OECD as an example? Are they, are they good at sharing and common data? In, in terms of uh, showing the comparisons there, yes. Uh, there are a lot of, in terms of administrative data, the UNEC has great information on how to assess the quality of administrative data sources or registers. So there, there is a pretty vibrant international community, <clears throat> and it's veering from administrative data into big data discussions, and so really understanding how to leverage that information. So the sign shows that there are five minutes left. Oh, one minute. I, no, I'm, I'm reading, I'm interpreting it as five. So we have, time, we, have, we have time for some more questions. We started late and we'll end on time. Oh, this is for Brian. It, it's less a question than a comment because here we're talking about success-oriented outcomes and your frustration about, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the frequent flyers uh, is, is palpable and, and n not even understandable. I, I'm a physician, so, you, you know, all the strategies are now to, to decrease that. Physicians have some accountability to populations and, you, you know, they're... I'm not sure, you know, this is a frustration on how whoever you spoke to at the hospital system must have been the wrong person. There has to be some people who can align solutions because we, we do, there are strategies for what people call hotspotters, frequent users to, it improves their health, it decreases costs, and I, I just want to say that uh, this problem um, is not a, a technical data problem. I don't think HIPAA is a problem in communication, but um, it, it's probably some leadership problem on your health side. That's all I, I you know, whatever comments you have about that. Just, you know, I don't want to get too tight down the weeds. In, in our area, they've actually, and as CEO of the hospital who I dealt with, but they've built a diversion program on their own so that when you show up at the ER, they're going to find a more appropriate spot for you. They built a whole other separate clinic, kind of a separate step down ER. That doesn't solve our problem as the people who are bringing the people in. And so when we went and said, look, we just don't have, there's no funding out there for us to do that. You know, that they, they get hit from a lot of different angles about that. So, but yeah, it's a va very valid point. And everybody's running with a limited amount of resources, so. And I think I, I would add that we've done some work on super utilizers in various jurisdictions and are in the process of uh, thinking through strategies on this very issue, not limited to healthcare, but in fact, uh, spanning across all social services. So there's a, uh, there, there's enormous overlap among different social services, like homelessness and, you know, and uh, mental health, et cetera, uh, and, and ERs, as you know. So the question is, can you create a unified data hub so that, so that we can identify those super utilizers who are using across sectors mm -hmm. Because the cost is actually much more than what you noted. It's not just the ambulance cost. No, that's I mean, it is, it is it. Right. enormous cost to the county and to the state. So can we identify that relatively small universe of people and create a unified strategy to address the root causes of their issues? And, but I think that, uh, even as Brian noted, uh, one of the issues with respect to hospitals is that they have their own thing. 
And so they have their own strategies for dealing with, uh, with super utilizers. And sometimes, for whatever reason, they're reluctant to collaborate in a more global or holistic strategy. But I mean, you're absolutely right that those strategies at a hospital level exist, and maybe even at a hospital system level. The question is, how do you translate those into systemic change that is cross-sector? So I think, exactly. I think we need, I'm going to end, or almost end, with a little commercial for Santa Clara County, uh, <laughs> which has done a pay for success program, which is just starting mm -hmm. to reduce high utilization of the uh, hospital and acute mental ill facility. And they've, they've contracted with a uh, for-profit vendor, Telecare, which has a good track record. So stay tuned, and we'll see how it works. Their, their goal there, by the way, is cost savings. That's going to be the metric, and they're not doing an RCT. So with apologies for my lapse of data <laughs> integrity, mistaking a one for whatever, uh, I thank our panelists very much for, for participating. It's so great to be at a place where people actually care about data and evidence. So thank you all.